Yeah. Sweet. So, uh, we've been on a first and second pizza series, guys. So if you're not yet received, if you don't have the, the sorry, I sent it out by email. So if you're new here or you don't have the email, nudge the person to your left, to your left, to your right, and they'll get it. <laughs> so today we're going through lesson one, a living hope. So it will be part two. Last, the last time, looking back at what we learned last week, we were called to focus above everything else on heaven. Our call was to focus on heaven. And some of the points were, heaven is the main goal and it is why we serve. Mm. Not the blessings that we gain here on earth. They aren't the goal. We went over how we, we are the elect. Chosen in God's foreknowledge. Meaning, he knew you were going to do it, but it meaning he chose you specifically. Mm. We must be filled with joy that we, that our hearts were in the right position to make all the good choices in our life. Come on. We must be filled with joy that we made, we managed to make the right decisions that led us to righteousness. Let's mm. go. So, the question was, are you still living a life, the life of someone who is elect? The next one was salvation by faith. If you don't have faith that the blood of Christ saves you, mm. you are actually just having a public bath. Wow. If it doesn't get any more embarrassing than that. <laughs> Not even today. Even today we must hold on to the faith that comes. For, uh, and that is what compels us to serve. Come on, bro. Mm. Is your faith growing or is your salvation fading? Wow. Come on. How have you grown in your faith since last week? Oh. The next one was salvation by prophecy. The prophets actually longed to know what we have. Yeah. They actually longed to have what we have. They longed to see it. They were fired up to see it, but they, they didn't see it. But they continued to do it because of how incredible it was. Mm -hmm. And they wanted us to have it. Even the angels are fascinated by salvation. And the question here was, how much do you value the scriptures? Mm -hmm. How much do you value your quiet times? The fourth point, the point that we finished at last week, was salvation by holiness. Mm -hmm. We are set apart by the washing away of our sins. Mm -hmm. We are set apart and made holy. And the godly life that we live is also something that makes us holy and sets us apart. Mm -hmm. We must live a life that separates us from the world. <coughs> and the question here was, what kind of life are you living? What kind of life are you living today? What is the difference between you and a non-believer believer that shares in the same morals in life? And so, with that, we come to the rest of the lesson that was for last week. Come on. But today, so what would have been point number five, but is now point number one, is salvation by redemption. Again, we're reading from verse, uh, we're reading sec, uh, first, uh, sorry, first Peter chapter one. And it says in verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life. Handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without ble blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. That's incredible but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Mm -hmm. We are redeemed from an empty way of life. Wow. Come on. There's nothing more that can, be, that can be said about life other than it is empty. It's true. It is only with God that we can experience life to the full. Yeah. You know, every time I go outside and I share my faith, people always ask about my accent. Some people say it's weird, sounds American, sounds Australian, sounds Kiwi. I know you guys disagree with all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like the fact that some people actually realize that I'm from England. I, I kind of appreciate that. When I was in England, I said I was a Kiwi. Now I'm here in New Zealand, I say I'm British. So people often ask me what is better. London or Auckland? Mm. Yeah. Real. Personally, oh. Oh. personally, I think London is an incredible city. Bye. 
There is nothing in London that you cannot do. There's never a bored moment. The city is massive. Yeah. Absolutely massive. If you've not been there, think of a massive city. <laughs> think of tra even the transport. Think of Think of this this is Queen Street right here. We're on High Street. Queen Street is just about, you know, to double High Street. And this is Auckland City. Mm. Now if this was London, <laughs> <laughs> Auckland City, <laughs> it would be about a fifth, uh, Auckland City would be about a fifth of Oxford Street. Wow. One street in London. Wow. And there would be, and in Auckland Street, you guys can probably help me out if you remember, there are about five to six train stations on Oxford Street alone. Wow. You could you could be lazy and just jump on a train a couple of meters down the road. <laughs> London is a great city. Give me your passport. But when I lived back in London, I tried to gain value for my life in how people thought about me. That was something I thought, okay, maybe I could gain some value in that. But at some point, I didn't even like who I was. I was too busy making myself into what this person liked. When I looked at myself, I was like, who the, who am I? I don't like this. Yeah. Though the city was exciting, people still had dead lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. They worked, they drank, they partied, and it was back to work again. Mm -hmm. Some are more. Some moved on to being married, which today really has little value in anyone's life. Yeah, right. yeah. The value of marriage has gone down. Yeah. You just go straight back to work, drink. Maybe you ask your wife to party with you, she don't come, you go party, and then you go back to work the next day. Life in London was empty. And so, so were the things around me, so was the life, and the lives around me were empty also. But when I became a Christian, life was fun. Mm -hmm. Life was incredible. When I started living the life of a Christian, it was in. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. My best friend Frank, and you know, I hope he sees this because I love the guy. Uh, my best friend Frank was truly the best friend mm. I could have ever asked for. Oh, mm. come on, Frank. He needed me as much as I needed him. That's awesome. And that's, that is a real friendship. And I found that in the kingdom of God. And each day we set about living our purpose for our lives. Mm. Seeking and saving the lost. Yeah, come on. That was almost all we spoke about. Mm. Hey, bro, how's that study over there? We would tell jokes about studies. Uh, not about the person, but we're, we're getting to some funky studies. Uh, and we're just saying, yeah, this study was so funny, this guy did this and did this, and it was just crazy, he threw milk at me and so on and so forth. Oh, gosh. Uh, and it was some crazy times. But we loved it. We loved the purpose for our lives. Our life was full. Come on. Frank then moved to Birmingham, where he, he started leading a church with this awesome sister called Christine Adamu. Mm. And man, when he got into that church, it had already been about for about half a year. He went into that church, and now that church is a fiery, cranking yeah. ministry. Oh if you check out Instagram, uh, you know, Frank's biggest worry is about getting a girlfriend, and he doesn't even have to worry about his ministry, because it keeps on growing. Wow. So, uh, you know, he, he has enough time to focus on a girlfriend right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm watching this. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about it all the time. I'm still trying to give him some advice. But my life today, my life also grew. I went to Australia. Mm. Come, uh, less than a year, about a year later, and now I'm here in New Zealand. Amen. I have great new friends and family members that stretch look far beyond just blood. Come on. That's one of you guys here. It's, it's, it's you. It is you. And not only that, this is the best bit. This is the best. Some of you could probably guess what it is. Some of you could probably guess what it is. <laughs> If you turn the camera around, it would be great. <laughs> it is Murari. Yeah. My wife. I managed to get a fantastic wife all within a year. Yeah. From the moment I landed, she was the first person to call me. And I don't know, maybe God set something in stone right there. God's foreknowledge, he let me know. <laughs> and now I'm even, I even have a dream of leaving New Zealand in January. I want to go to Fiji. Come on. Yeah, leaving New Zealand to go to Fiji. I want to go to Fiji Come and start on. a church there. And when I'm in Fiji and preaching, I also say, someone once asked me if I like Fiji or London. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big city. <laughs> when that time comes, it will be awesome. Yeah, it will. But yeah. my life is so full. Mm. 
Yeah, come on. And I am so thankful that my life was taken away from the Antinos. Mm -hmm. It shows how much being a Christian actually changes you. Yeah. yeah. The quality of life is not based on where you are. Yeah. Or come what on. you have. It is based on your relationship with God. Yep. Let's go, Chris. Yeah. Come on, Chris. But don't think that just because you are in a good place now, you can't go back. Mm. Right. Relationships mm. do break. Mm. They really do. So, are you still living a full life? Mm. So ask yourself that. Are you living a full life? An easy way to know is by asking yourself, do you love your life? Mm. There are some challenges that come, yes. But do you love your life? Mm. Okay. Some of the challenges could just be going out sharing. Some of the challenges could be doing something you don't quite want to do. You want to be lazy and lay at home. Mm. But if you're living a full life, you'll still deny yourself and still get fired up. Come well, on. Today, we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. We were in the devil's pawn shop. Pawn, uh, pawn shop. But God redeemed us. At a price so high, we cannot even realistic. We cannot have a realistic idea of what he paid. Mm -hmm. No idea. We often think that the best things in life are the things you pay a lot of money for. Mm -hmm. This could be your shoes. This could be your car. This could be your clothing. This could be your TV. This could be your watch. This could be anything. We can even go to the extent of thinking. Our lives are also worth the price of gold. Mm. We're willing to pay a, a sum to live our lives a certain way. God thought different. When he saw us, he sent Jesus, not as a rich man with a briefcase full of cash, but he made an exchange for guilty lives for an innocent life. Mm. Just to give you a bit of a comparison, this is like Marari taking off her ring her wedding ring, both the engagement and the wedding band, turn around to Callie, saying, hey, can I give you my ring for the shorts you wore to play basketball? Mm. Can I get, in fact, give me your, your, your socks. Oh. Here's my ring. Can I have your socks? Mm. No one here would do that, especially the sisters. <laughs> <laughs> and we've we, we got to idea, you know, they value their wedding dress, so we know they're going to value the ring. Mm. And brothers, if you're single, you don't quite know, just know a ring is not worth a pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> we can't even live our lives, we, we can't live our lives as though we are trying to pay our way to heaven. Mm. That's not the way to live your life. Don't try and live your life as though you're trying to pay your way to heaven. We can't look at sharing our faith as something we should do. We, sh we shouldn't look at sharing as something we should do or... I don't deserve this life. If we look at it like that, I need to share my faith in order to deserve being a disciple. Mm. Again, it won't work. Mm. We can't have our quiet times as though we have to do it, mm. or we don't deserve this life either. Yeah. Mm. Again, we shouldn't have that mindset. Yeah. And above all, we cannot look at this life as a competition. Mm. We cannot compare ourselves to others in this room. Mm. The one thing with the sorry one. Uh, the one with the most studies or baptism does not win the first place prize right. of having expenses, on, pay, expenses paid to go to heaven. Come on. Yeah. You cannot have guaranteed salvation just because you got the most baptisms this year. Yeah. You cannot have the most. You can't have guaranteed salvation just because you give the most contribution. Mm. Don't compete. Mm. Redeemed before the creation of the world. God's plan of redemption was in his mind long before Adam and Eve. Awesome. <laughs> long before they were created. Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. This is, uh, you can find this in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. In view of this reality, in God's mind, from the beginning, he could have forgiven those before the cross. In Romans chapter 3 from verse 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. It also says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, for, the for this reason, Christ 
is the mediator of a new covenant. That those who are called may receive the promise, the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sin committed under the old first covenant. But time means nothing to God. That's something we must understand. For in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But do not forget uh, this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Mm. From the start, He prepared man's way to safety Come on. from their failure. He always had a plan in mind to help us and to save us. Yeah. I think of this one example that really helps me understand this. Come on, Chris. Um, I was, how old was I? It was before college, uh, six from here, and I was about 40, no, 60. <laughs> <laughs> and I did this thing called the challenge, and it was a great, it was a great thing where we get to, the, uh, I get to meet so many different kid, uh, young people and go out and do camping with them. So one day we were going on this long hike, and we're going through the woods, and the guy says, "Hey, does anyone want to read the map?" And you know me. <laughs> So I grab, he gives me the map and I grab it, um, and I'm like, we need to go this way. And I'm so sure we need to go that way. Mm -hmm. So I start walking and everyone starts following. Oh. And I'm like, we need to go this way, we need to go this way. Oh. And, and the intervals of me giving the directions slowly went, uh, slowly um, got longer and longer, mm -hmm. to the point where I didn't even know where the map was. <laughs> um, I was busy talking and I was at the back of the line. <laughs> Thankfully for the guy who gave me who gave me the map, he knew the directions before he even gave me the map. Mm -hmm. He didn't need the map, and so he actually led us in a big circle all the way back again. And then he was like, "Who wants to give us directions?" And I said, "Me." And I, I looked around. I was like, "Oh, okay. This is where I got the map last time." <laughs> and I said, oh, where's the map? And I said, "Oh, here it is." But God always has a plan for God had a plan for a time when it went wrong, mm -hmm. and he for, because of he because he's outside of time. He saw where it would go wrong. Mm -hmm. Just as the guy saw I was going to get something wrong and made his way. <laughs> Revealed in the last times. Come on, Chris. The phrase last times has no reference to the so-called end times. Often mentioned by religious leaders who have made a mistake uh, of, out, of, out of the view of prophecy. The last days began on the day of Pentecost. In 33 AD. We see this in the book of Acts in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 verse 16. Uh, no, this is, this is what was spoken by the prophet Job. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy and young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. The fulfillment of the ages had come in the first century. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Mm -hmm. The last days are when God started speaking through Jesus. Redeemed by trusting God. Our focus is not on ourselves, but on God's, God's uh, redemptive work. Mm -hmm. To focus on our good deeds makes us feel self-righteous. Mm -hmm. We start feeling like we can make it. To focus on our bad deeds makes us feel defeated and hopeless. Mm. The focus on God, on what He did for us all. Mm. You know, at the end of last year, I was so focused on myself. I remember one time um, we were jumping into a little follow-up, so just to fill up our stats and share uh, who has Bible studies and when the Bible studies are. So the men get with the men and the girls get with the girls. Um, and so we'll go in and we're, we're, we started going through the stat sheet and sharing the Bible studies we had. But before we had even begun, a brother, meant, a brother said a little funny joke and he said, Okay guys, we're here to look at Chris's Bible studies. And that was because at the time I was having many Bible studies and not everyone else was having as many. And so I started comparing myself. I have more Bible studies than that guy. I'm far better than him. I have more people than him. I have more friends than him. I started comparing myself mm -hmm. and I started to feel comfortable because I didn't think I had to try that much. I didn't think I really had to do much. I was comfortable feeling good about myself and tried very little to actually help 
people around me. Mm. Though at the time, at the same time, I was angry and annoyed. Frustrated because I expected God to reward me with what I had done. Yeah. For what I had done. I expected God, hey, I did this, now you've got to give it to me. Mm. I paid the price, now you have to give me the fruit that I want. You must reward me. I was angry and uncomfortable. Uh, sorry, angry and comfortable. I don't even know what that looks like. When I think of angry, I think of... <sighs> you're just shifting around, but you're kind of comfortable, but you don't know how to stay. That was me! I didn't even know what, I didn't even know how that looked. I don't know how I looked, but it definitely did not look good. Focus on God is always going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. He's always going to call you to change. Yeah. You have a better relationship with Him. Yeah, come on. Because we live, more so we live in a non-God-fearing world. Yeah. People don't care about godly things. So it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Even though it is uncomfortable, it still is a happy life. Yeah. It's going to be uncomfortable, but you're going to be happy. Compelled to serve because of how thankful we are. And how full of uh, and full, how how full our lives are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of the great value we now have in our own lives. Come on, Chris. We're going to be fired up. As said, if we focus on him, on heaven, the bumps feel like nothing. Yeah. yeah. What are you focused on today? What are you focused on today? What have you been focused on? What has been your most constant thought today? Mm. Has it been one that concerns God? Mm. Or has it been one that concerns your wants, your desires, or your worries? If God was your focus today, what would be the, mo what would be the least likely thought to come to your mind based on your character? Mm. Now ask yourself, how often did that thought linger in your mind today? Let's focus on God. Let's have a focus on God today, guys. Out of the gratefulness of the fulfilled, of the fulfilling life that we live today. Come on. Let us focus on God. Salvation by new birth. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1 from verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. Mm. For you have been born again, not of, perish not of a perishable seed, but of an imper but of imperishable. Mm. Through the living and enduring word of God. Mm. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. Wow. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. Mm -hmm. But the word of the Lord stands forever. It's good. Come on. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Come on. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Wow. Go, Chris. Come on. New birth must be accepted. We purify ourselves by accepting God's offer. As said in Acts chapter 2 verse 40, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Mm -hmm. We obey the truth in order to be purified. Mm -hmm. If we have been united with him, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Mm -hmm. yep. New birth results in love. Love for brothers, love for the brothers, uh, here is the Greek word is used, philo. And this means a friendship type of love. Whereas in the command to love one another deeply, the Greek word is agape. This means unconditional love, which describes the very nature of God. Yeah. Although we must feel and demonstrate both types of love, the order suggests a rather obvious lesson. The prospect of great friendship often attracts us to the church in the beginning. But this 
level of relationship must lead to a gap in love. Yeah. If you're looking at people in this room, you are going to see a gap in love. And if you're visiting, you're visiting because of that feel of love. You're visiting because there's some awesome friendship. Am I right, Kofi? <laughs> the new birth must be based on the word of God. Let's yeah. go. Come on, Chris. Men and their traditions perish quickly and dramatic. <laughs> but scripture does not. Right. Yeah. It is the living relevant word met mentioned in Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the divide, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Mm -hmm. Which was also, and the word of God will also stand forever, and before which we must also stand. For it says in John chapter, in James chapter 2, verse 12, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged wow. by the law that gives freedom. Mm -hmm. The new birth must produce a new life. Each person here who has experienced a new birth must be living a new life. You must get the poison of this world out of you. Get the milk in you and never lose the taste of the Lord. Mm. In conclusion, salvation by redemption. Focus on God, not on yourself. Come on. Yeah. Make your goal to grow in your relationship with God. Come on, Chris. When you have an aim to grow, you have measuring steps. Mm -hmm. So, think of your first one right now. Think of your first measuring step right now. Write it down. And then before you leave here today, share that with someone. Tell someone what is your first measuring step to grow in your relationship with God. What are you going to do? What is your practical? And then go out there and do it. Salvation by new birth. Live your new life and make it spiritual. Come on. Come on.